All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. The discussion that we will do today is the um, the testes and any damage to them due to COVID-19. We have had this discussion once before. However, <laughs> there is a backstory this morning. So some of you who follow me on Twitter would know. This morning I tweeted that for protection of your testicular function, and liver and kidney with ivermectin, please use selenium and vitamin E. That was a cool bean who yesterday showed me that study and I thought it was interesting and vitamin E and selenium is not something bad. We have actually talked about selenium in the co context of COVID-19 usage previously as well and uh, concluded that it was useful. So when I um, tweeted that, so many people ask that, hey, what should what should be the dose and good to know, et cetera. But there were a couple of doctors. <laughs> One of the doctors is from FLCCC. And he, he came up and I think he thought that somehow I am um, against ivermectin. And that is why I said that use this, otherwise there could be damage. So he became very animated in Twitter. And he said that, uh, started making fun of it, saying, you know what? Uh, maybe if you are a rat and albino rats may have this issue and so on. And then he said that I'll tell you what can cause infertility, absolute um, uh, testicular damage and threat of infertility is COVID-19 itself. Then there was another doctor who came up and he said, uh, this is utterly nonsense that we're talking about vitamin E and selenium in the context of ivermectin. I have been treating liver and renal damages with ivermectin and never had a problem. So anyways, um, I responded and I said, I always, always take care of my patients and I'm on the side of safety. So if with ivermectin, there is any chance, even you know that we have had this discussion once before that there was one case of hepatitis with ivermectin in the whole state usage of ivermectin. So it's not a big deal, but still there was a case. So well, if there is a chance to protect it, why not? So <laughs> in that, so I observed this just like with hydroxychloroquine, that there became camps. So there was a camp that was hydroxychloroquine and there was a camp that was not hydroxychloroquine and they were fighting with each other. So to me, it seemed like there became a camp of FLCCC and ivermectin, and somehow they thought I was not ivermectin guy, and they thought it was necessary to attack me. So then I talked with them and I said, look, I have been talking about ivermectin way before FLCCC talked about it. So don't worry, I am pro ivermectin, but if we can add anything that can help protect, I will be for it. So having said that, I thought it was interesting to talk about the male fertility because there were some warriors who started bringing up studies to say, look, here is COVID causing uh, issues with fertility and you should know them. And so I thought that what we'll do is this, we'll do two um, sessions. In, today, in today's session, what we'll do is we'll look at the testicular damage, testicular structure, immune privileged sites of the testis, and then how much damage has been observed so much so far, how much concern we should have. And especially in the context of the statement that there is an absolute damage to the testis and threat to male fertility. And then the second session we'll do later on, maybe not today, tomorrow, is the ivermectin and any possibility of any other damage like um, testicular damage or liver or kidney damage with ivermectin. So this is the plan. Hope you're all doing good. Um, <clears throat> hope you are having fun. Welcome to everyone. I'm just looking at the comments here. I see almost everyone here. So hello to everyone. So let's start. So this is drbean.com. There are some studies that are here. So this is not a study. Instead, this is the immune privileged mechanism of testis. 
So we have some immune privilege sites. For example, brain is an immune privilege site. Similarly, testis or ovary. And then there are other sites as well that are immune privileged. So I wanted to make sure that we understand what does it mean by immune privileged sites. That's one. Second, I wanted to go over various studies that show testicular damage or not during COVID. So there are a few studies that are here. And finally, one um, heads up, I have excluded those studies that looked at autopsies of people and came back and said, in the autopsy, we have found following tissues that had SARS-CoV-2. And I actually had to respond on Twitter this morning as well as well. When somebody has become so ill with COVID, that they eventually die. Their last moments, their, the mechanisms that are occurring in their body, unfortunately, are that their blood vessels have dilated severely and have become damaged severely. And there is the fluids and the blood components that are leaking out of the blood vessels. And when these are leaking out of the blood vessel, they can leak into any tissue. They can leak into brain or testis or liver or kidney or any other place. So looking at an autopsy and then saying that there is a proof that, that the virus would end up here or there is a difficult thing to apply to mild, moderate type of diseases. This is possible. Somebody in a severe disease who fortunately does not die but recovers but has gone through that swing of vasodilatation and cytokine storm and things oozing out. I shouldn't say oozing out, coming out of the blood vessels, going into the tissue. They may actually have tissue damage, cardiac tissue damage, renal tissue damage, or testicular damage, or brain damage. It is possible if they have become so severely ill and then recovered. So I have deliberately excluded that part because over there it makes sense. I want to talk more about those cases where people did not become severely ill and almost died. But before that, what happens? So let's start. You ready? So today is going to be a tiny bit X-rated discussion as well because we're going to talk about testis. So anybody who is shy, this is your, <laughs> your uh, clue to uh, close your eyes. <laughs> All right, so let's start. So here, first of all, thank you to everyone. Yesterday, we reached 250,000 subscribers. Now, between Facebook and YouTube, we have touched uh, 1 million subscribers and fans. So thank you very much for that. I did not think that we would reach there. I was not planning for that. I was not doing this to do this. Um, or chase the subscribers, but thank you very much for helping. Thank you for your support. We have reached here together. For me, this is a big deal. I know others are near millions, but this is a big deal for me as well because I did not even expect this much. All right, so thank you very much for your support, for your journey together, and let's continue our discussion. So those who are shy, please close your eyes, maybe ears as well. And let's start. So first of all, <clears throat> testis, fertility, and COVID. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at the structure of the testis, number one. Number two, we are going to look at the immune privileging mechanism of testis and what does it mean? What does it mean to be immune privileged? Then number three, we'll see how the testis protect themselves from infections or what? how do they behave and then we look at the COVID behavior from studies. So here is a generalized, uh, easier structure for testis. So imagine, of course, there are two testis in scrotum, and then each testis is further covered into covered in many layers. So the outermost layer, and then there is another layer inside that is called tunica albuginae. Then within the tunica albuginae is the tissue of the testis that makes sperms. So here, if you look at this diagram, in this diagram, the blue lines here 
imagine that this is a ball the blue lines i am showing a cross section but imagine that it is actually a ball of of connective tissue imagine it's a purse like thing inside that ball are multiple small tubes inside the tubes sperms are made so if you see here these orangey things uh, imagine they contain lots of tubes and these tubes collect together here at the this is this area is called reet testis at the reet testis they all collect together and make one big tube and that is this big area epididymis so reet testis will all collect together they will make ductus differences or smaller uh, tubules which will then become one big tubule called epididymis epididymis has a bigger area on top which is called the head then it has a body then it has a tail and then it becomes ductus deferens and that goes all the way to the um, to the prostate gland over there it connects with the seminal vesicles and then they all open up in the urethra and that is how through the penis the ejaculation are, comes out and that has sperms as well so that is a basic structure so what is our takeaway here what do we keep an eye on this orange area and these red lines that i have made here these are the tubules we are going to look into these tubules because that is where the sperms are being made so this is the general uh, discussion uh, structure of course i have to anthropomorphize these things so testis does have eyes here ideally i think each testis should have one eye and then two of them will make two eyes but anyways this one testis has two eyes here okay continuing what is immune privilege immune privilege does not mean that the tissue itself will not become infected immune privilege means that the tissue is tolerated by our immune system and there is no war there is no destruction that occurs by our immune system so testes are immune privileged means that even when there are things in testes that are antigenic that are foreign that are viruses or bacteria or even sperm are actually a foreign thing for our body because sperms are haploid our cells are diploid so we we have cells with two x chromosome and sperms have half because sperm will fuse with mother's ova and then they would become diploid so sperm are actually a weird foreign thing for our body and our immune system inside the testes is stopped from attacking anything so imagine it's a sacred area where immune system is asked not to react even when it sees an enemy there so immune privilege doesn't mean that there cannot be a virus there immune privilege will mean if there is a virus we are going to tolerate it over there if there is a bacteria we are going to tolerate it over there we are not going to attack it rigorously why because if we did it you have now seen with sars cov2 when we attack a pathogen in that process the inflammation that occurs can cause tissue damage so imagine if there is a virus sitting in the testis and our immune system attacks that virus in that process it destroys the uh, the tissue the testis itself as well then we have a problem so i hope that that uh, this topic that what is privilege means privilege for us should be immune system is asked not to function fully there immune privilege doesn't mean that a virus cannot come in or a bacteria or a fungus or something else cannot come in they can come in immune system would just not respond with the full force so how is that possible so let's say this is a testis here and then number 1 we have testis blood testis barrier and i would in the next slide i will talk about that that what is a blood testis barrier just like we have blood brain barrier that separates the blood from brain tissue similarly we have blood testis barrier that separates the sperm making areas from the blood tissue blood 
so that the immune system cannot attack there. Luffy, you okay? What happened? What happened, Luffy? So <clears throat> that is one. Second, the lymphatic drainage. It was supposed in the past that the lymphatic drainage from the testis does not occur. Although it has been proven wrong, we have seen that lymphatic drainage does occur, but it is not as elaborate as from the other tissues. And now please remember, lymph drainage means that from some tissue, let's talk about testis. So let's say these are testis. From the testis, the, the bigger particle, for example, let's say the testis is infected with a pathogen, bacteria. And that bacteria is big enough that it cannot enter the blood vessel from the blood vessel pore. So what would happen is that bacteria or broken cells will have to be washed out through lymph and they would go in lymph nodes. That whole system of lymph nodes is actually made up of T cells and B cells and immune system is involved in that. So if there is a tissue lymphatic drainage, that will mean there is going to be an immune response because wherever the lymph is going to go, that lymph node, which will receive the lymph, will become mad. It would have T and B cells that would become activated and they will go to that area and start fighting there. So the lymphatic drainage in the testis is less, which is fine. Then the physical structure of the testis is such that it acts as an immune privilege site. And I will talk about that in the next um, slide. Then it has local immunosuppression. It has systemic immunosuppression. And the most important thing, testicular protection is primarily by innate arm, very little by the adaptive arm, and almost zero by the humeral part of the adaptive arm, meaning there are no B cells seen in testis. There are fewer T cells that are seen, helper and cytotoxic. There are much more innate arm cells, especially macrophages. If there are more natural killer cells found in the testis, then normally such men have difficulty with fertility. So presence of more natural killer cells in testis is an indication of a problem with fertility. So even within the innate arm, there is a specific balance. And that balance means more macrophages, then dendritic cells, then other cells. So keep this in mind and we'll go through this now. So <laughs> how uncommon is a testicular pain as a presentation? So this is a Cape and Max. Testicular pain depends upon the person, their lifestyle. Uh, it can be because of continuously sitting incorrectly. And in such people who are not sitting correctly may have testicular pain very often. Then there could be the type of work that people do that can cause pain. Otherwise, generally, if testis are protected from abuse, then generally there is no uh, testicular pain. OK, so uh, so there are, Jana Taylor says, wear loose undies. Um, <laughs> Trevor says, I used to do things in the evening. Now I watch lectures with cartoon testis. Yes, and cartoon testis that are saying, oh, well, we are immune privileged. OK, so let's continue. Now here, we are going to dig into the testicular tissue itself. So where are we going here? If you see, this is a testis. And if I actually go here, this area, this small tube over here, that is responsible for making the sperms. Imagine we are looking here in two or three tubes and the tissue between them. That is the area we are going to look in. And thank you very much for the uh, super chat. <laughs> uh, testosterone can increase the risk of severe COVID-19 in males. So SNC nutrition. Okay. So we'll look into that as well. All right. So continuing. <clears throat> So let's look at the testicular structure deeper inside the structure. So let's orient ourselves. These rounded things are the 
the seminiferous tubules, or these are tubes in which sperms are made. So sperms are made in those small tubes, then they all are collected together in epididymis. From there, they are brought to prostate. From the prostate, prostatic fluids that make the fluid or liquid part of the ejaculation, they are mixed with the sperms and then that all is ejaculated. So here, if you see, this is one tube, this is another tube, and this is a bigger tube that I have opened up to kind of show us inside. Now, first of all, divide this whole picture in two parts. Inside the tubes is one part, and then between the tubes. So this area here, that is the area between the tubes. This area is called interstitial area. Actually, this term interstitial area is a common term for all tissues where the cell make the functional part. And between the cells, the spaces are called interstitial spaces. Imagine if you are sitting in a classroom and wherever the humans are sitting, imagine human is a cell. So they are all functional tissue and the spaces between the human and the classroom will be called interstitial space. So here we have interstitial spaces. Inside the interstitial spaces are lots of immune cells. Majority of them are macrophages. So if you see these cells here, these cells are macrophages. 20% of the cells here, immune cells here, are macrophages. After that, there are dendritic cells, some natural killer cells, uh, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, B cells are usually absent. Mast cells are also present, which sometimes can cause allergic reactions and damage, but they are also present. Normally, they should be less, just like NK cells as well. So that is in the uh, interstitial area. There is another specialized cell that sits in the interstitial area, and I made it separately. It is actually present all over the place here as well. This cell is called Leydig cell. So Leydig cell are special cells in the testes that help make androgen. Androgen are the male hormone. Androgen means man. So androgen is the male hormone. In women, androgens are further converted into estrogen. But in men, androgens stay androgen. And the one major androgen is testosterone. And now think about it. Our testes make their own testosterone. So I actually have a little cartoon over here that I drew. So these are two testes. One testis is saying, we make our own steroids, we, meaning we have our own dexamethasone or budesonide. And the other testis is saying, dude, stop telling them everything. They will steal our steroids. So testes have their own steroids production. They not only produce steroids for themselves, they produce it for the body as well, in addition to the suprarenal gland. And because of that, you can think about it. Wherever steroids are present, steroid would cause local immunosuppression. That is what we use steroids for. So testes are the factories of making steroids for the whole body. So when the steroids are present within them, that local area is going to be immunosuppressed. So let's go back here. This was my way of <laughs> helping you remember that there are steroids in the testes. So back here. So in the interstitial spaces, we have macrophages, NK cells, some mast cells, some T cells, some um, cytotoxic and helper, no B cells, ideally. And we have Leydig cells. Leydig cells are, they do two things. Number one, they make androgens. And number two, they are antiviral. They can actually kill viruses when they find them. Of course, there are macrophages here as well that are very efficient in killing viruses and bacteria as well. The only thing is the killing in the testis is done silently without lots of noise, without cytokine storms, without lots of hoopla because we do not want the immune system to overreact and in the process destroy this little tiny tissue which is testis. So the whole thing is kept hushed and then the things are killed. So Leydig cell help in that, macrophages help in that, and so on. Now let's look at the testis and uh, the blood testis barrier. So focus here with me for a second. These tubes 
that are responsible to make sperms. If you see from outside inward, on the outside, they have special cells. These, the ones that I've made in red over here. Imagine this is a rounded structure, which has bricks outside. Those outside bricks are called myoid peritubular cells. They are outside cells of the tube. Of course, tube is a structure, so it is going to be made up of cells. It is just made up of many cell layers. So we are looking at the outside cell layer. That is called myoid peritubular cells. Inside the tube are these blue cells. These blue cells are called Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells. They are also called nurse cells. They nurse the newly forming sperms. Sperms or ovas are very delicate things in our bodies because they are the things that would help us continue our generations. So they are nursed and pampered right from the beginning. So the when the sperms are being formed, they need to be very delicately formed. They need to be kept protected. They need to be given proper nutrition and so on. So those nursing cells for them are Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells, these blue cells here, actually line the whole interior of these tubes. I deliberately only made a few parts of it, but they would actually line the whole, whole inner surface of the tube. These Sertoli cells with the myoid cells, outer cells, they make a substance that is secreted between them. So imagine two people standing and they are making a wall between them. This substance, which I'm showing here in this orange, this is called the basement membrane. This is a wall between the outer cells, myoid cells, and inner cells, Sertoli cells. This wall, myoid cell, and Sertoli cell, all of these three things together, they form what is called as blood testicular barrier. This causes the blood fluids and blood things to stay out and blood components cannot reach directly to sperms, red blood cells or other cells. Blood cannot touch sperms. It is kept outside by this barrier. And then inside here, if you see these little red cells here, these guys, the red guys here, they are spermatogonia. They are the beginnings of sperms. And there are millions of them. And we keep producing them. Women normally have a set number of ova, still a huge number, considering they have one ova released every month. Although for even for one ova release, they have many ova that start becoming matured and ready to be released, but one of them will win and will be released. On the other hand, men would make sperms every single time and tons of them. So these red things are the spermatogonia or initial cells that will make sperm. These will be nursed by the Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells are actually large cells that made them small. And as the these spermatogonia passes between them, imagine multiple mothers that are uh, uh, that are sitting next to little children that are developing and they just keep pampering them as they're developing and protecting them. So that is what Sertoli cells do. So as the spermatogonia start maturing, they start taking the form of a um, sperm. So from a rounded structure, they'll start becoming elongated. Then they'll start developing a head and a tail. And finally, if you see here, here is a sperm, although <laughs> quite, a, quite a lazy sperm, but oh well, this is a sperm. Now, sperms themselves also release interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor. Do you remember interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor from the ivermectin discussion? That when the SARS-CoV-2 arrives in our cells, it blocks our cells from releasing interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor and nitric oxide so that the cells cannot protect themselves. So as soon as sperms are formed, they start secreting interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor so that they can keep their defenses up and they can keep their surrounding cells defenses up. 
So they start making the cells around them stronger too. So if for some reason a bacteria or virus enters here, they are not supposed to enter here. This is the immune privileged site. They cannot enter here. But if they enter here, number one, the immune system here is going to be very strong because we have interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor by this, the sperms. Secondly, we have immune cells here that are going to eat up the pathogen. But here is the thing. We don't even tolerate immune system cells to be sitting in this area. We just don't want them there because if they are there, they may accidentally start destroying the Sertoli cells or the spermatogonia or the newly forming sperms. So what happens is we have special mechanisms in there which make the cells commit suicide. So if a T cell enters in this area by accident, let's say there was a damage to the, the seminiferous tubule and the T cell entered in. As soon as they enter in, we have fast, fast ligand connectivity, which is an immune system bond. And this bond is a, is a kiss of death. If fast, fast L ligand is done, the cell that activate this thing, those cells would commit suicide and they'll die. So as soon as the immune system cells are brought in, they are asked to commit suicide and die. So we keep this part of the seminiferous tubules to be very, very clean, protected, and devoid of any pathogens in here. That doesn't mean pathogens cannot enter here. They can still come in, destroy the tissue, and enter here. But this is the mechanism. This is a structural and cytokine mechanisms inside the testis to keep the testicular areas privileged and clean. In addition to producing androgens over here that just keep the whole immune system generally suppressed. Good. So I hope that with this much of the discussion, this is clear that testis are not just some little things sitting out there and they are totally um, at the mercy of SARS-CoV-2 deciding to invade them or not. Testes have their own multiple mechanisms. And if I can show you this very quickly, if you go over this one, this is an older article. The newer article has have even more clarity for the mechanisms. But if you start from here, you would see that this article has actually discussed these blue ones are seminiferous tubules. This is interstitium. And they've talked about various cells in there and the cells functions in there. Here, these blue ones are the Sertoli cells and these are the nursed um, spermatogonia. And then these are the outer cells. And look at these cells sitting in the interstitium and they are secreting interleukin-10 and they're secreting other things that keep the whole inflammatory process down. Remember, interleukin-10 is also released by T helper 2 cells and that causes reduction in the immune system. It calms down the immune system. So here, what is happening in the testis is not that there cannot be a virus or pathogen there. If there is something there, our testis would very quietly and very, in a low-key way, clear it out. Maybe the rest of the body should learn from testis as well and not cause a cytokine storm and in that process kill the body. The lungs should go to testis and ask them that, hey, dudes, how do you do your function? We should learn from you. Because testis can clear the pathogen without causing all that damage, and lungs do not know how to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. So here, if you see various, this is the innate immune system and the behavior of the innate immune system. So this is a beautiful article that lays out various functions. So hopefully, so far, so good. Now I'm going to go to studies that we have seen with, the, with testis. So we, we looked at this cartoon that the one the this little testis is telling the other one that hey dude don't keep spilling the beans and telling the secrets. And now here is the first study. This is one study, then this is another, and so on. This is a study here. Assessment of SARS-CoV-2 in human semen, a cohort study. So objective here was not to prove that there can be SARS-CoV-2 in testis or not. The objective was, is it going to be transmitted through sexual interaction? And so if the SARS-CoV-2 can enter 
the testes and then from there the epididymis and all the way to the prostate and then from the urethra outside then maybe it can be transmitted so here 34 men were distributed as patients in convalescence so we're going to look at this so what they did was they had 34 people some of them were recovering some of them were controlled meaning they did not have the covid and some of them actually had acute covid i like this part because acute covid means there could be some vascular damage there could be some problem that sars cov 2 could actually enter every cell and here is what they found they asked them to give semen um, samples and of course the the ones that were in acute state they did not ask them to ask to give them semen sample they would not be able to it would be an unfair demand so they waited for them to recover and then ask for the semen samples they took their blood samples as well and the results were no SARS-CoV-2 even in acute patients moderate infection patients had low quality semen so WHO has a criteria for what is a good quality semen. So they saw that the acute patients, moderate patients had after some days when they took their semen, their semen quality was low. And that is actually possible with many diseases, not just with SARS-CoV, but the semen quality was low. The SARS-CoV-2 itself was not found. Now let's look at the second one. This is a young man with orchitis. Orchitis means, uh, so if you can see here, this is a testis which is kind of red and painful. So this is an inflamed testis, a swollen testis because of infection. A testis can swell up because of many things. For, for example, somebody kicked somebody in the uh, testis and they have now a testis that is uh, damaged or that is uh, uh, swollen because of the injury. Orchitis is a specific term that we normally use <clears throat> when a testis has testis has infection in it and then it swells up and then it is painful then we say it is orchitis so here is a young man who had orchitis so this is the second study this one and what you would see is the difference in these studies is that some authors will come back and say well testis have a lots of ace2 so it makes sense for the virus to be there and then others would come out and say the testicular tissue has less ACE2, and so it is understandable that SARS-CoV-2 is not there. So meaning the data is yet not high quality and big enough to able to be able to make a decision. So here, let's look at this one. Testicular pain as an unusual presentation of COVID-19, a brief review. So here they saw that SARS-CoV-2 may enter into the host cell by binding to ang angiotensin converting enzyme. This receptor seems to be widely expressed. So here they're saying widely expressed in different testicular cell types. You would see one more study soon that would say that uh, ACE2 is sparsely present in the testis, so less present. So making possible the occurrence of orchitis, the pain and swelling with infection, and from a review of the literature, it seems that there is currently no evidence of sexual transmission of SARS-CoV-2. However, the possibility of virus-induced testicular damage and dysfunction cannot be excluded. So this is a negative, right? So when somebody stands up and says, I don't think we can say that SARS-CoV-2 will not affect testis. Now you have no way very quickly to come back and say, no, it is not possible until you kind of start taking biopsies from testes from a lot of people who became uh, you know sick and then recovered or you start asking for semen or you so without doing a lot of testing you cannot uh, refute these statements so they simply said well somebody had testicular pain so we think that the SARS-CoV-2 may have been there and because it may have been there we should be careful fine so here is that study young man with orchitis ACE2 binding no evidence of se sexual transmission Testicular damage, question mark, that's what they're saying. So again, I think you can understand this is not really a study. It is a one case. Then here is the next study. This study says no evidence of severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 in semen of males recovering from coronavirus disease. Again, they had 34 people in here. And here is the result. Six patients, 19%. 
demonstrated scrotal discomfort suggestive of viral urchitis. So what they saw was that there were 34 people in the study. And then out of those 34, six, 19% had scrotal discomfort, possibly because of urchitis or swelling because of, let's say, viral issue. However, they saw no virus in the semen 29 to 36 days after the diagnosis. So, of course, a patient who is a SARS-CoV-2 patient, you cannot just start going to them and say, I need your semen. And uh, that's going to be a difficult thing. So now this study says AS2 and TMPRSS2 are sparse in testicular tissue. So this study is coming up and saying, you know what? It is actually understandable that there is no problem in the testis because look at this single cell transcriptome analysis demonstrates sparse expression of ACE2 and TMPRSS2 with almost no overlapping gene expressions. No overlapping gene expression, meaning that neither are they present one by one or no, nor are they present together. So this study says the testers actually don't have enough ACE2 and TMPRSS2 receptors to be able to host the SARS-CoV-2 and work with it. So this is another study. Conclusion. Angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 mediated viral entry of SARS-CoV-2 into target host cells is unlikely to occur within the human testicle based on ACE2 and TMPRSS2 expression. So they have their own way of expressing that, hey, there are not enough receptors for the virus to go in. Now, please remember, there is a bigger picture piece that we have not seen yet. And that is what we are saying is, so let's make a human being here. So what we are saying is that this person had infection here in the nasopharyngeal area. From there, the infection went to the lungs, possibly. Not in everyone, but let's say in some. And then from there, infection actually ended up in the scrotum. That is what we are saying. So how did it go from here to here? Was it lymphatic? Was it blood born? If it was blood born, which can happen here as well, that means that the virus actually entered the blood vessel, then it ejected the blood vessel, did not take care of the blood testicular barrier, did not uh, respect that, came out, attached with the cells, and then infected them, and then infected the local area. This in itself is slightly difficult unless cytokine storm has occurred, blood vessels have become damaged, they have become porous, the virus can go in them and come out of them more easily, and the person is almost at the brink of death or in a really bad state. Then the cardiovascular system is compromised and the pathogens can move in and out of that system easily, it makes sense. But in a normal, lesser severe case, this should not be a common occurrence. So back here, so here this is the other study, 34 people, not a big study. And finally, one more case study here. This is the last one, and then I'll stop talking about the testis, uh, if it is bothering you at all. <clears throat> so a coronavirus disease, 2019, patient with bilateral orchitis, a case report. Now, usually, when there is infection, usually infection is on one side. It's usually does not, it doesn't go in both compartments. They both have separate blood vessels and they both have separate compartments, although they are living in one scrotum, but inside they are living in two separate compartments. So sometimes one uh, scrotum, uh, one testis can become infected without the other one necessarily becoming infected. So here bilateral orchitis, meaning both testis became painful, is usually not a sign of infection. This is usually trauma. This is somebody kicking and or somebody falling or somebody sitting incorrectly and so on. But here, there is a case of one person once again who had pain and swelling of the testis. So if you see here, this person had RT-PCR positive uh, 
COVID-19. He presented to hospital with his general constitutional symptoms like cough and other things. In addition to that, he had bilateral testicular warmth and discomfort. The warmth will be because of extra blood flow. So any place where we have inflammation and there is more blood there, that area will become warm. So warmth is actually a sign of extra blood flow, which means there may be some inflammation going on. And so now this diagram here, where SARS-CoV is stomping on testes and destroying them, this study would, I'll show you some writing in there, that they said in the past with SARS-CoV-1 and other coronaviruses, we have observed testicular damage in which tubules got damaged. So maybe if that happened before, it may have hap it may happen again as well. This was just the connecting, trying to connect the dots. Just like very often I say, well, SARS-CoV-1 gave us immunity for three years. So possibly SARS-CoV-2 will give Im immunity for that much as well. This is a similar thing that these authors are doing. They're saying, well, Previous coronaviruses are known to cause testicular damage. So maybe this one will cause that too. So let's look at the study. So if you see here, we describe a novel case of SARS-CoV-2 bilateral orchitis in a previously healthy 37-year-old male who presented for testicular pain with constitutional symptoms, meaning cough and fever and other things. And if you see here, um, they said that non-react... So because there was te testicular pain, they ran other tests as well for infection. So the syphilis was negative, treponema pallidum was negative, then the gonorrhea was negative, trachomatis was negative, and urine did not have any growth cultures as well. So on testicular ultrasound, bilateral non-specific increased blood flow was present consistent with orchitis, meaning testes were swollen and they were warm and they were inflamed. The patient received some medicines and then he recovered. I think that they did not follow up to say, give us semen as well to see what is the quality of the semen. But this is one more case. So please remember, um, 34, 34, one case, one case. That is what we have so far other than testicular damages in autopsies. And in the first 34, they said no, um, no proof, evidence of SARS-CoV-2. Second 34, no evidence of SARS-CoV-2. First 34, they said in some, there was some reduction in sperm quality. But I think that if they kept looking at it, they would have seen that it is recovered. One case and one case are, the, are these ones. And again, I don't think that this is something that can be generalized. Believe me, if testicular damage was this, this large and widespread, there would be more <laughs> noise than what we hear today. So uh, conclusion, look at this. With the progression of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, rare reproductive complications should be characterized rare. Why are they saying rare? This is a rare complication if you see here. Rare complications should be characterized in order to better recognize. Because number one, with SARS-CoV-2, usually testicular pains do not occur. And then bilateral orchitis does not usually occur. So this is a rare, rare thing. So they're saying, please keep an eye on this. And here, Leydig cells in the testes being the ACE2 receptor. So they're saying that Leydig cell, remember the androgen making cells? They're saying that they have the ACE2 receptors so maybe they are the ones who got infected. Then they've talked about older studies. So if you see here, previous SARS virus family infections have caused orchitis and epididymitis with subsequent spermatogenic tubule dis destruction, as well as oligospermia and azoospermia. I want to make sure that we keep it in mind. I'm not trying to scare you. These are one cases, one cases. What I'm presenting to you is, it is not something to worry about. And in all cases, there was no infertility issue and there was no destruction of the testis. So that tweet this morning, um, he's a doctor which is part of FLCCC, who said, I will tell you something that would cause absolute testicular destruction and threat, threaten the fertility is COVID. 
that is wrong. So uh, if you see here, lady, uh, similar previous SARS virus family infections have caused orchitis and epididymitis with subsequent spermatogenic tubule destruction. Oligospermia means less number of sperms and azoospermia means sperm that cannot move. This novel case of bilateral adult orchitis without epididymitis, so no infection in the epididymis, may potentially follow suit. One case of epididymo orchitis secondary to SARS-CoV-2 has been reported in previously healthy 14-year-old male. This pattern of concomitant epididymitis with orchitis is more typical as compared to the above case of Pfizer, whatever. So what they're saying is we have seen such cases before in SARS. So we should just keep an eye. And they keep saying it because this is one case. They keep saying it, rare reproductive complications. And so they have to look at this one and say rare because it is rare. So this is the discussion. I have taken 51 minutes discussing it. I thought I'll do 15 minutes and be done. So how is everyone over here? How, how are things? So how about we do this? We close this. This has become already very long. And then I come back online and we do some chit chat and then we continue on. What do you think? <laughs> Paul says doing well. Thanks for a clear discussion. Uh, Jim says question is epididymitis curable. I've had mine for years. Yes. So basic problem to figure out is what is the reason for that? And then, yes, it is curable. Uh, what I have seen is that in some patients, their lifestyle or their sitting style or their working style is such that they just keep causing trauma to their uh, testis and they keep causing recurring epididymitis or orchitis. So one has to be kind of mindful of that as well. John says things are fine here. Um, Steve says, I saw good news about Moderna vaccine today. Excellent. Um, Patricia says, very good topic and explanation. Great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Barbara says, we have the Motley crew over here. OK, so let's do this. France is saying that close this and come back. So let's do this. We are going to close this, and we're going to come back. So my on my way out, once again, please like, subscribe, and share. And there is a, if you wanted to buy me a coffee, there's a link to buy me a coffee. There is another link to be a petra, patron for me. And then there is a link to support this work if you like it. So once again, thank you. And I would see you in another few minutes.